you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> hey folks, Scott Weingart here. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I like to bring upstairs care downstairs. And the way I like to do that is ultrasound everything that walks or gets carried into my ED. Now, the critics will tell you that Mike and Matt are not the greatest ultrasonographers that have ever lived. And they're right. I've searched every body of literature known to man, and I've concluded that Cliff Reed is actually the sexiest man alive. After Rob Orman, of course. But I digress. What I'm here to tell you is this. This week... You're listening to yours truly talking about the rush exam. Now last week we learned about pericardial effusion and all about how much I love the IVC. If you missed that, stop what you're doing and check out last week's episode. If you've completed the high and the high map, then sit back and listen to the second half of the rush lecture by Scott Weingart, myself, at Castle Fest 2013. But I'll say, it just gives you a ton of information initially when you look at the IVC. And really, all you're looking at the, at this point for the rush exam is, is it big, is it small, and does it move with respiration? And there's a bunch of studies out there saying you can get a precise CVP with the ultrasound. And, and maybe you can, maybe you can't. I don't care, because I don't want to know that. I just want to know, huh, it's collapsing completely with respiration and it's tiny. Well, that's a patient who doesn't have high filling pressures on the right side of their heart right now. or no collapse, big IVC, that's a patient who either has some RV strain or they're fluid overloaded, something's going on. And it's just that dichotomous qualitative assessment. That's all you really want for this purpose. And you know, if you saw that patient with some um, circumferential fluid around their heart, but you couldn't really determine, is this tamponade or not? I can't tell, it's moving too fast, they're tachycardic. Um, if the IVC is big, that tells you their heart is not capable of absorbing their venous return. So th that pericardial effusion with a big IVC, that's important. So it it's just adds on to your information. And this is all we're trying to go for in the critically ill patient. So normal IVC, pretty uh, reasonable size, you know, 1.5, uh, 2 centimeters. And it has maybe slight collapse with respiration. A patient who is hypovolemic or has a extraordinarily good heart function, they're hyperdynamic. Uh, might have an IVC that completely collapses and it's small. So there's a normal IVC. Generally, and I'll tell you more about this later on in the next talk, uh, you look, find the hepatic vein or one of the hepatic veins and you just look a, a centimeter beyond that, that's where you want to measure, and you just see how much respiratory collapse it is. I don't even bother measuring with calipers or anything. I eyeball and I just see how much movement there is with respiration. And this is a patient with some collapse. And this is a patient who has a lot of other problems, but uh, in terms of their IVC, you can see big black stripe, not collapsing at all as the patient has a respiration. And one more shot of a collapsing IVC. That patient's probably going to benefit from some fluid. All right, so that was heart and IVC. The next thing is up is you going to. Sorry? Yes. You have some cases where you see the IVC big and not collapsing, but they're still end up being fluid responsive. I absolutely do, and that is exactly what Mike and I are going to be talking about. So it's a fantastic question. You're foreshadowing the exact stuff we're going to mention. Any other questions? All right. So let's talk about the abdominal views. So essentially, this is just the same stuff you're going to grab for your FAST exam, but you're going to do it on the medical patient. Why are you doing it on the medical patient? Because you're going to find out a ton of information. Sometimes they're going to have um, a spontaneous cause of intraperitoneal bleeding. Sometimes they're going to have, um, we had a patient with a colonoscopy. And I guess the uh, GI doc was ramming a little bit hard and actually ruptured their spleen. And then we went to the uh, literature and found that that's actually pretty common. And it makes you think about that whole CT colonoscopy real strongly because uh, that, that doesn't sound fun at all to go in and do your entire bowel prep and then uh, sit there on the table and then realize they've broken your spleen in half with the uh, colonoscopy probe. So there's a whole bunch of reasons that you could have um, intraperitoneal bleeding as a result of non-trauma causes. Though I guess that is 
a form of trauma. Um, but, <laughs> all right, so you, you guys know this part, because this is like the most fundamentally basic exam in emergency medicine. But you're going to get your Morrison shot. That might be the best place, especially if you put them in a little bit of Trendelenburg for seeing a little bit of fluid. And it's not projecting well, but there's a nice little crenulated stripe up there um, right between the hepatic and renal interface. And so there you go again. Oh, actually, no, that previous one was normal. I'm just imagining. This is the shot I was imagining showing you. So there you go. A little bit of fluid coming in. Nice, beautifully sharp edges and coming up off the tip of the liver from the paracolic gutter and pushing in. All right, this is a, uh, and I don't know how well this projects, but you see this little area where it's just kind of speckly, moving around a little bit. This is liver parenchyma there, this is kidney, and there's just something there which is not black and very easily could be missed. Um, that's clotted blood. In fact, uh, this patient was a 22-year-old female, uh, came in hypotensive. Um, we got this ultrasound, and uh, in, in, initially it wasn't picked up by the residents, and then we took a look, and we're like, damn, that looks like blood. And then uh, we did a transvaginal ultrasound as well, and there was a little heartbeat in the ovary. Um, and... So there you go again. All right, so after you do your Morrison shot, you're going to come up and do your left upper quadrant. And I'm sure in your fast exam you've heard all this, but it's not the actual kidney-spleen interface. You really want to look for fluid. It's subdiaphragmatically. That's where it's mostly, most likely to gather, and you really have to get a great shot of the diaphragm for this, and you can see the little tip of the spleen floating in a nice little puddle of fluid here. Um, this might actually be the one on that colonoscopy guy. At the same time you're doing your right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant shots, you're also going to look at the lungs as well. And that's going to give you an idea, is, is there fluid in the lungs? That fluid could be a hemothorax. It could just be pleural effusion. And um, you're just going to do that by tilting your probe up a little bit towards the head. And now you're going to get a shot of the entire diaphragm and just take a quick look at the lungs. Yes, sir. So, I mean, of course, the context, I think this would be everything. Um, and if you have a baseline healthy person and found one finding, it might be really easy to act on that. If you were to take a really sick, say, cancer patient who could have fluid in a bunch of these places, how would you start to figure out where you want to intervene? Yeah, so it's tough. And um, so let's say you had a patient with a big pleural effusion, and you're like, oh, I don't know, is that blood or is that fluid? Uh, I just take a 22-gauge, a one-and-a-half-inch needle and, and under ultrasound guidance to find the pocket, I, I take a look at it. And then, oh, that's straw-colored. Okay. So they got some problems. That might be affecting their respiratory status, but that's not a source of bleeding. That's not why they're hypotensive. And then if you have enough of a pocket in the belly, I do the same thing. And it, it's not that whole big rigmarole you do for a paracentesis when you're actually going to do a large volume tap. I mean, essentially, I put on a pair of sterile gloves. I swipe with some chloroprep. And I put in a tiny needle. And you really, you can't do much damage with a 22-gauge needle. I mean, someone here will manage to do something horrible and blame it on me. But <laughs> for the most part, even if you hit something, you're not going to do too much damage. And if you find an ultrasound pocket, um, you, could, you could get there. And, you know, the nice thing about this is you're not planning on taking, you know, 10 minutes worth of fluid out. So even though the needle's only an inch and a half, you just keep pushing. You know, you guys have all done this, right? You just keep indenting the skin until that eventually becomes the equivalent of like a three-inch needle. And I mean, you could always put on a spinal needle if you need it. But the point is, if you just get a little bit of fluid, now you could just say, okay, well, that's blood or that isn't. And that's how you take that out of the picture. Now, I don't recommend doing that for the pericardial effusion unless you're sure, because that's a little bit bigger deal. Um, but that, that's the way I'd start knocking stuff off if I can. If you can't, well, then you've got to get further imaging. But at least now you know this up front. You could do the whole prep for taking a sick patient to CT if that's what you need and figure it out. Does that make sense? All right. So, like I said, you're going to take a look at both of the uh, lungs from your right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant view and see if there's any fluid there. And so this, you know, that's your diaphragm. And this patient actually has both intraperitoneal fluid and pleural fluid. It could be blood. It may be in a trauma patient. You always assume it is. In a medical patient, it could be anything. It's just one more piece of information. Wow, they got a bunch of fluid there. The lung's kind of hanging out amongst a bunch of fluid. Is that part of the problem? All right, so here's another shot. Get your diaphragm here and just a little sliver of pleural fluid right there. 
And you can see um, everything, for me, I'm looking, is it dynamic? Is that fluid changing size with respiration and as I move the patient around? And here's a much bigger amount of pleural fluid with some clotted blood in there. All right, and these are your pelvic views. We'll skip over those. All right, you can now look at the aorta. Now, everyone knows if you're showing up at your board exam and they give you like the 70 year old with uh, you know, a little flank pain and pee and blood, that the answer is always going to be a triple A, right? That's what they're trying to, to knock you off with. And, but for some reason, and I don't know why it doesn't come through, like when you see the 80 year old guy and their BP is like 105 over 60, that, that's a bad thing. Old people don't have low blood pressures like that. It doesn't happen. By the time you hit 85, no one's walking around with that. Some of them might have done well and they're only at 120, 130. But these slightly low BPs, something is going on. Either they're septic or it could be they have a AAA that's ruptured. And you've got to get in there and look right away. And pretty much any elderly patient that's sick, it's so difficult to assess them. All their you know, clinical signs kind of change and mutate as they go through the aging process that we pretty much just do a rush exam as soon as they get brought into our resuscitation area. If they're sick enough to be back in the area I staff, then they're sick enough to get an ultrasound examination right up front. And that, you know, that elderliness basically fulfills that LLS sign. If they're sick and they're old, then I want to see their aorta and the rest of their body to figure out what's going on. And so for the aorta, you're just going to get four shots. You get one just below the xiphoid. You're going to slide down to a suprarenal shot, an infrarenal shot, and then at the split to go into the iliacs. Um, and uh, so there's the aortic slide right there. You just slide on down and transverse, probe indicator towards the patient's right. And then if you can, it's always fun just for the bonus to, uh, to get a nice longitudinal shot of the entire aorta. And that's really nice to document, too, if you get that shot because it shows you've imaged the entirety of the aorta. All right, and so if you get a hypotensive patient and they look like this, that's not good. And it doesn't matter if you could assess for the actual blood of the rupture, because sometimes it'll be intraperitoneal. A lot of the times, if it's still contained and hasn't broken through peritoneum yet, it might be retroperitoneal, and you'll have a very difficult time imaging that on ultrasound unless you're amazing. So as a result, it doesn't matter. It's just like the effusion. If you have a triple A, by size, and for me it's anything greater than five centimeters, I start getting scared um, in a sick patient, then you just assume that's a ruptured AAA, and you get the vascular, the cardiovascular guys involved, and then it's up to them if they want to stop by CT and confirm or not, and then they should be doing that. You don't want to be the person taking a, a order that looks like this, the CT scan, until uh, some other service is taking responsibility for that patient. So, if you see a big aorta in a sick patient, that's a triple A with a rupture until proven otherwise. All right, you could throw on some color because sometimes it gets filled with clot and it starts blending in with the surrounding parenchyma. And one more. All right, so that was heart, IVC, your abdominal views, your aorta, and then last, you're going to do some pulmonary shots. Now, you're going to ask yourself, what's going on with those lungs? And the first question you're going to ask to tick off the list is, is this a pneumothorax? Now, again, you say, okay, well, we know that in trauma, but this is not going to happen on a, a patient who had no trauma. But, and it does. I mean, we all know the spontaneous pneumothoraces. And then there's always the iatrogenic pneumothoraces. Like, you got a uh, sign out, you got a sick septic patient, you look at them, and they got two 18-gauge IVs, and all of a sudden they start crashing, and what you're previous team failed to sign out as they tried multiple times for subclavian, couldn't get it, and just decided to stay peripheral. And that, that's happened enough times that I don't believe anyone doesn't have a pneumothorax until I've ruled it out for myself. Um, and, you know, a lot of these patients with blebs, they might rupture, and, and so that might be the cause of the patient's hypotension. Now, you might say, well, I listen to lung sounds, and they don't have um, any absence. It can't be attention pneumo. And I, I've been... Um, incredibly surprised by how perfect a lung exam could be on a patient with full-on tension. So I, I stopped carrying a stethoscope. I would rather just throw on the ultrasound probe because it doesn't lie like most of the clinical signs do. All right, so 
you're going to get your normal pleural interface here between two ribs. And if you see beelines or you see actual movement, then you're feeling pretty good that at least at that point on the chest you're looking at, there's not pneumothorax. And Vicky's going to talk far more about this in a bit. And here you've got a patient, they have respiratory movement, but the actual pleural interface, there's no real sliding. I don't see any beelines. And that's a patient who, at that point, there's probably some air under my probe between the lung and the pleural. Now, you could do these in M mode and actually throw M mode on the area you're looking at. And you get this as the seashore sign where you have a whole bunch of interference here from movement on the M mode. And the actual chest wall itself, there's not movement, so you get the beach and the ocean. Uh, I found this on crappy machines could lie. And this is great for documentation, but my residents like to go right to this without looking because it's just they think it's objective. And we've been fooled because um, our, our probes have been dropped so many times that you, know, you, you really become an expert at Rorschach analysis. So um, this is how we document whether there's a pneumo or not to put into the you know, record, but this is not how we're making our decisions. And then this is a, a pneumothorax, a stratosphere sign where everything is just lying straight across, and that's bad. All right, so here, again, you get movement from the patient breathing and the lung pushing up against the chest wall, but there's not any actual pleural movement and there's no beelines. And in M mode, um, bad. Yeah, let's see, I don't think this one. Now, we used to say just do the pneumothorax and stop there, but it's, it's usually worth it to go further and just get a general gestalt about what's going on with the lungs. Are they filled? Is there interstitial edema or not? And so you could just take a quick glance if there's no sign of the pneumothorax. Are there a tons of beelines you know, going across the entirety of the screen? That's going to tell you that there's some interstitial edema. Now, what it shouldn't tell you is that the patient's volume overloaded, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but... Um, seeing this, uh, or eventually seeing these signs of interstitial edema does not mean the patient has too much volume. It doesn't mean they don't need more fluid. And if you take one thing from this lecture, take that. Is sick patients get alveolar capillary leak, meaning their SERS response, that systemic response they get when they're sick, actually causes lung leakage. And it could very well be your patient is markedly fluid down and yet still has interstitial edema. Now, this is bad if you decide not to give the patient fluid as a result of seeing this. And it's good if you gave the patient four liters of fluid and then the ICU guys come down the next day and show you an x-ray of pulmonary edema and say, you killed this patient. And no, you didn't. You saved their life. Um, what, what the problem was is that they have the alveolar capillary leak and they need even more fluid because if they're leaking in their lungs, they're leaking everywhere else. And so don't Assume interstitial edema is synonymous with volume overload, both on x-ray and on ultrasound. You can sometimes diagnose pneumonia on this as well. You could, it's usually going to be at the pleural interface where you're going to see anything. You can see actually the equivalent of bronchograms on the x-ray on your actual ultrasound as well, which is really, really cool. And I'm sure Vicky's going to go over that in detail. So I'm not going to dwell on it, but you could actually just Diagnose the pneumonia with no chest x-ray or anything and feel really good about your diagnosis. In fact, better. This is actually more accurate than um, a one-shot chest x-ray. And we already talked about pleural effusion. And you could either look at that with your linear probe now during the lung portion or you might see it during the uh, abdominal portion. And so we repeat the, that's those same two lung shots um, when we actually do our lung portion of the exam. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. How, how, how do you differentiate with the IBC when they're on <coughs> CPAP or BiPAP or mechanical ventilation? Yeah, it becomes much more difficult. And uh, you can no longer use collapse. And in fact, when they are on mechanical ventilation and um, getting mechanical breaths, and that's key because you can still spontaneously breathe on the vent if you haven't sedated the patient a bunch. Um, but if they're getting mechanical breaths, it actually is the opposite. And now the signs that the patient actually needs some more fluid are the IVC expansion. Now the problem is you can't eyeball it anymore. The numbers in the literature have a wide range, but generally um, if you see an expansion of greater than 13%, some studies say 17%, 
uh, that's going to be a patient who is going to respond to fluid. And in fact, the literature is very robust for that purpose, for a patient who's mechanically ventilated for IVC. Uh, it's kind of crappy, as you'll hear Mike and I discuss, for the spontaneously breathing patient. But if you're able to do that exam, and it really does require caliper measurements, you have to measure it at its smallest and then at its largest. You don't really need to time it for the breast. You just measure it when it's tiny and when it's biggest. And if there's a variation of greater than 13, I use 17% to really get the uh, specificity going, uh, they could definitely benefit from fluid. And you probably should give them 1,000 cc's of whatever crystalloid you like. So that's how you do it, but it's the opposite of what it's going to be for a spontaneously breathing patient. But again, you've got to be careful to make sure that the patient is not spontaneously breathing if you're going to do that, because that's going to mess you up. Because the spontaneous breaths are going to show some collapse. The mechanical ones are going to show expansion. And you can't use the variation between those two to do it, because those will vary quite a bit. The patient completely collapsed their IVC with one of their spontaneous ventilator breaths and then have a small amount of expansion on their, uh, on their mechanical breath, and that's going to send you astray. That is it. What, what, if, what if they're like, I mean, these people are lots of times, they're on like AC setting, uh -huh. and they're sucking in really hard. I mean, are they still going to? Yeah, they can mess it up. If, if, they, if they overwhelm the flow of the ventilator, they can. Um, so for me, if I'm going to use this IVC exam in a mechanically ventilated patient, I'll either do it on patients who we've just, uh, just intubated and they're still under the midst of their paralysis or we have sedated them because they're a bad brain injury patient and I want to keep them. But for most of my patients, I'm keeping them spontaneously breathing and it doesn't have as much relevance. Any other questions before we go to cases? Yes, sir. So if you have a, a generous uh, right ventricle on your apical floor chamber and you decide to look at the legs, what percentage of the time do you expect to find DVT in the legs to, to confirm your diagnosis? Sure. So uh, the numbers I've seen are about 30% of the time you'll actually find a clot. But most of those are based on um, really good official studies. So if you want to even get to that 30%, you really do have to extend into the calves. You have to look super carefully. I don't know if you're going to find them as often as that in the patients who you're just doing the two-shot standard ED DVT exam. But it's worth looking because now you have your diagnosis. But it's not going to be as frequent as you like. How are we doing on time, Mike or Matt? OK. So let's go through some cases. So case one, patient came in. This was their echo. And the reason we were doing the rush exam is their BP was 60 over 40. And so we saw this. We did the rest of it. We didn't find uh, too much else except for their IVC which looked like this. So we gave them, I think we gave them four or five liters of fluid. And then we come back and we repeat our rush exam. Now the IVC is not moving. And we look back at the heart. And this, this is a short axis shot, and this is all we had to put up here from this patient. I don't know why these were the images that got saved. But you can see the LV is not doing much anymore. It was slamming before, and now it's just kind of, eh. And this is what Mike was alluding to during his diastology lecture. Ah, uh, diastology. Many of you remember our diastology podcasts. If not, go back and listen. Or just wait a bit. We're going to revisit this soon. I thought Mike's diastology lecture at Castlefest last year was pretty awesome. I think he's refined it a bit and made it even a little easier to understand than the previous podcast we did. So we're going to put that out for you soon. And speaking of diastology, a quick housekeeping note. If you have our introduction to bedside ultrasound on inkling.com, that version, let us know if you find any errors in it. Evidently in the final coding build, a few images, clips, and things got mixed up and rearranged. We're correcting them, but if you find any we missed, let us know. We think we have most of them, though, so refresh your version before emailing us about them. Yeah, okay, that didn't have anything to do with diastology or the rush exam. But I just thought about it, and I was meaning to get that out. Continue. This is the really important take-home, is oftentimes severely septic patients, which is what this patient turned out to be, will have cardiac dysfunction, we'll have diastolic dysfunction, but it's not intrinsic. It's actually induced from the septic state itself. They get cytokines that actually cause heart dysfunction. And again, initially this patient had a beautiful heart function, and then when you start doing um, your afterload optimization, now all of a sudden it unmasks the sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. And in these patients, what they need is they need inotropy. The first thing you should do is take a look at what their ionized calcium is and replete that because that's, you know, 
God's inotrope. But once that is at a good level, then you should add on something like dobutamine or, or milrinone or whatever inotrope you like or switch them from whatever presser they're on to something that has uh, a more inotropic profile like putting them on epinephrine, switching them off something like phenylephrine or uh, even norepi. And all of a sudden you're going to improve their LV function. So that's the key is to not just do that one shot echo on these patients because they're going to change as you resuscitate them. Okay, so case two, another patient came in hypotensive, um, just complaining of some chest discomfort. And we throw on the uh, echo probe for the first portion of the rush exam, and we see fluid posteriorly. There's a little bit anteriorly as well, but posteriorly, and it's, it's anterior to the aorta, so we're feeling pretty good. And as we're looking at that aorta um, to see that it's make, to make sure that fluid's anterior, see a little something in the aorta. Could, could you guys see that from the back? Yeah, that, so that wasn't good. And uh, so then we got a little bit closer. We zoomed in. Now, huh, I don't like that at all. What's, what's going on there? And, and there, there. so uh, this patient at the hospital I was at, we didn't have cardiothoracic available. So uh, we, we actually sent one of my residents in the bus with them. Um, and they actually made it and got their dissection fixed. But you could pick up a bunch just by looking at this stuff. And uh, we had the pericardiocentesis tray with them sent, didn't require it, and we all felt pretty good because that's no fun at all. Um, case three, patient came in after finishing dialysis and their blood pressure was now 60 over 40. And you, know, you, you have a tendency sometimes on these dialysis patients to say it's fluid shift. These guys are really, really good cases to do the rush exam on or just throw on the heart on the uh, throw on the probe on the heart because a lot of times they'll have pericardial effusion and you look like a superstar diagnosing that early on and you look like a real failure if uh, the patient winds up going into a rest from this and no one diagnoses this until the ME. So they had tamponade and we actually, <laughs> we actually, dra <laughs> we actually drained this one in the department um, which if you're not doing it under ultrasound guidance you're just crazy because that whole blind sub xiphoid thing scares the hell out of me. Um, so I always use ultrasound. Okay, so <laughs> then, <laughs> then I'll just tell you then, um, because it, it's been game changing for me. What I do is I, I will grab the uh, high frequency linear probe, and if I could still get a shot of that effusion, on the, one of the parasternal windows, and I don't care which one, because I'm actually looking what's going on there. So I, it doesn't matter which rib space, I don't even look. I just slide that linear probe on, and if I could see heart and effusion, then I'll use the linear probe. Now, sometimes the patient has too much chest wall, it's not gonna penetrate enough, and I have to go back to that general purpose. But if you can see it on the linear, and very often you can, unless the patient's really obese, then that's how I do it. And I'll just slide the probe on in transverse, so now it's sitting horizontally on the chest. And if you could do that, then you could actually watch your needle going directly into the effusion, and it's beautiful. And I actually now have these um, uh, specific needles for nerve blocks, They're, and I have uh, ones that will fit the wire from the central line kit. And they have these little crenellations on the tip that actually look like bright stars on the ultrasound. It's beautiful. You know exactly where your tip is. And I have the Pajunk ones, but again, I take money from no manufacturers, but those are just friggin' amazing, because the entire tip is just like these bright stars, and you can just track it down, and I actually watch it go into the effusion. Now, if you can, you can just take some saline. You don't have to do that thing with a three-way stopcock, which you watch the cardiologist do for PFOs. If you just take normal saline and give it a shake, um, you can now just inject a tiny little bit into uh, where your needle is and make sure it's actually in the pericardial space and not in the ventricle, because that's that's very disappointing to get out, you know, 800 cc's of blood and now the patient's <laughs> worse off. So it's nice confirming. Sometimes I'll do it with just the needle in there or sometimes I'll put the wire in and actually advance my catheter. I'll just take the catheter right out of the central line kit. That's just fine if you don't have a formal kit. And uh, I'll actually check it at that point if not because um, it's better to check with the needle because you don't actually want to dilate the ventricle. But, um, but if, if you've got in there, at least you know you're in the wrong spot. So. It's nicer to do it from the needle. And if you are in that 
pericardial space, now you can actually float in the catheter and just drain out as much fluid as you can. And we'll just actually put either a three-way stopcock on, or sometimes if you take a 5cc syringe um, and put it at the end of a central line but take out the plunger, that will fit the end of a Puravac perfectly. Um, I only recently <laughs> discovered this by one of the uh, thoracic surgeons. So you, does that make sense? You just take the barrel of a 5cc syringe and put it on the end of your central line, and the, uh, the Puravac plugs into that perfectly. It's nice and tight. And now you can make a drainage system for whatever you want, for this, for um, anything you need that is a catheter-based thing. So sometimes with a paracentesis kit where we want to have a continuous drainage of fluid, we'll just hook that up. So ultrasound is absolutely key on that. All right, where's the evidence for this whole rush stuff? Um, Alan Jones, who is the you know, guru of non-invasive sepsis, actually studied this in 2004. And what they did is they just asked the docs, OK, what do you think is going on after doing your ultrasound versus a group who didn't have ultrasound? And they just looked at time to diagnosis and correctness to diagnosis. And it looked good. It's not fantastic literature. Um, this study just came out in intensive care medicine, another very similar program, multi-organ ultrasonography. And what they found is that a lot of the times the diagnosis they made by ultrasound was right when they looked retrospectively of all the evidence. So for whatever that's worth. Um, we're actually doing a trial specifically of the Rush version we use right now in our department. That was uh, that fellow I showed you, Amy Sangvi and Phil Andres, are running a trial. I'm um, looking at a similar thing. Uh, what was your presumptive diagnosis before doing the ultrasound? What was your diagnosis after doing the ultrasound? And did that change your diagnosis and how often? There's a whole host of these out there. This is a very nice review article by Seif and um, looked at all of the various uh, ultrasound exams for medical hypotension patients. And they all, you can see the components of them. They're all basically the same stuff. And this, anyone who's doing ultrasound for any period of time, it's intuitive. These are the things I'm going to look at. All right, so let's bring it all home. HIMAP is the acronym, and it's also the order you're going to do this in. Heart, IVC. Morrison's and abdominal views, aorta and pneumothorax. It takes about two minutes to do when you get savvy at this. The sequencing, start up on the chest, get your parasternal long. If you can't get it, get your subxiphoid. Get an apical four chamber. Take a look at the IVC. Your three abdominal views, aortic slide. Look up on the chest, and then, you know, subsequent to this picture we've added on, just coming back to the chest with that high-frequency linear probe and just taking a look at the uh, flanks as well. We're at the stage now where everyone's performing a fast. The machine's being rushed to the bedside for every trauma patient. We should do the same thing for our medical patients. We should get that rapid diagnosis for the medical patients as well. Because oftentimes, they're tougher to figure out. You get the trauma patient, you know what's wrong with them. They're bleeding somewhere. And all the fast is telling you is where. But they're, what's going to happen to them is usually the same. They need to go to the operating room. The medical patients, they could languish. They could just keep getting more fluid, more fluid, more fluid. Eventually, they get stuck on a dopamine drip somewhere, and you're just missing what's really going on. Don't let that happen to you. Get the diagnosis right up front. Bring the ultrasound the machine to the bedside. Get an idea of what's going on with these patients. If you have any further questions, you could email me, or you just go to mcrit.org, and the contact info is there. Man, I can see why Scott is such a world-renowned speaker. Little known fact, we had to hire security at Castlefest last year just to keep the groupies from jumping up on stage with Scott. Actually, that's a lie. Scott can defend himself. In fact, you've never lived until you've seen Cliff Reed and Scott Weingart go at it Krav Maga style in a castle. All joking aside, I can't believe we've gone two years on the podcast now, and I especially can't believe this is the first time we've actually really talked about the Rush exam. It still amazes me to this day how utterly wrong I can be when I attempt to clinically diagnose the reason for someone's shock. I mean, sure, sometimes it's obvious, and I get it right. But then again, sometimes it seems obvious, and I just miss. And I don't mean a little check swing. I'm talking full-on wiffle ball style strikeout, where the ball's still up on the tee. So next time you think you know why someone's in shock, take a look anyway. Hopefully you'll just be confirming your suspicions. But I bet every once in a while, you'll find the answer wasn't something you were suspecting. I know I have. Well, there you go. Two years in, and we finally delivered the Rush exam. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see lectures like this one and others from Scott Weingart and other amazing lecturers, check us out at CastleFest 2014.
you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it.